together with open-mindedness, unity, and anonymity, these principles help protect Na as a whole when applied in our group affairs. While autonomy gives us certain freedom, it also implies responsibility for our actions and for the continued well-being of Na. As groups, we exercise our responsibility to the fellowship by taking inventory of our behavior and how we hold meetings. Our group exercises its autonomy in a responsible way when it takes care to consider the common welfare of the fellowship as a whole before it acts. Open-mindedness is essential as we are to use autonomy to help not grow. With an open-minded attitude, we are more receptive to new ways of reaching addicts. We learn to find and fill our needs in the not community. We encourage each member of the group to contribute thoughts and ideas. Our attitude of open-mindedness helps us remember that each group is part of a greater whole. Acknowledging that we are part of something bigger than ourselves prompts us to look at still more new ideas. Our diversity can enrich us only when we are open to its richness. Remembering our part in the greater whole, we consider unity when we think about applying the fourth tradition. Any decision that we make as an autonomous group ought to be founded first in our common welfare. Although we are autonomous, we may offer loving support to other groups by attending their meetings or offering other help. Now meetings strive when groups look beyond their immediate needs to offer help to each other. Love is the principle that guides us to see Na as a greater whole. This impacts our responsibility as autonomous groups. Our group's autonomous decisions, based on our love for Na, will serve to strengthen our efforts to serve others. Love encourages us to reach out to other members and other groups, finding ways to cooperate with them in carrying the message of recovery. Anonymity applied to the fourth tradition reminds us that each group has an equal place in the fellowship of Na. Larger groups are not more important than smaller groups. Older groups are not better than newer groups. While all groups have the freedom to apply principles in whatever ways seem best to them, those same principles make each group an equal partner in recovery. Each group bears an equal responsibility in the work and in the reputation of Na. Autonomy in not just groups the freedom to act on their own to establish an atmosphere of recovery, serve their members, and fulfill our primary purpose. The responsibility that balances our autonomy reflects the principles expressed in the first three traditions. Preserving the unity of the Na Fellowship comes first. Next. We seek direct ion from a loving higher power. Then, we hold meetings that welcome everyone with a desire to stop using. Healthy, vital groups are essential to the growth of Narcotics Anonymous. Groups provide a place where we can offer our most basic service, one addict reaching out to another with the message of recovery. Without our autonomous group, we would be unable to fulfill our primary purpose. Tradition 5. 71. Each group has but one primary purpose to carry the message to the addict who still suffers. Our primary purpose is at the heart of our service. With guidance from a loving higher power and a clear focus on this purpose, Na-groups become a channel for the healing power of recovery. Narcotics Anonymous exists to help addicts find freedom from active addiction. If we were to espouse other ideas or pursue other goals, our focus would be blurred and our energies diminished. 
The fifth tradition asks us to practice integrity by keeping our purpose foremost. Tradition 5 helps our groups fulfill the fundamental reason for their existence, to carry the message to the addict who still suffers. As we learned in the fourth tradition, now groups are free to find new and different ways of presenting meetings. This freedom is important, it protects and encourages diversity, letting us reach addicts by many means. In this autonomy, each group develops a character of its own. The character of the group is not its purpose, however. The message we carry is not our group personality but the message is narcotics anonymous the principles of recovery. What is the message that we are asked to carry? Groups carry the message of Na, hope and freedom from active addiction. This message may be voiced in many ways. Sometimes we simply share that if we don't use any drugs, we won't get loaded. Other members share that they have found satisfying, productive ways in recovery. Sometimes the message we share is that, even though life may be painful, we can stay clean. The spiritual awakening we experience when we work the steps is also our message. When addicts experience the message of recovery, we find healing from our suffering, no matter what the cause. We can live drug-free and establish new lives. That is our message. That an addict, any addict, can stop using drugs, lose the desire to use, and find a new way to live. The group's focus on carrying the message is so important to the survival of not that it is called our primary purpose. That means it is the most important thing we do. Nothing ought to take precedence over it. This is the most basic guideline by which groups may examine their motives and their actions. There are many ways in which groups can further our primary purpose. Generally speaking, group members start by creating an atmosphere of recovery in their meetings. This includes extending a welcome to every addict who attends. Stable meetings that start on time carry a message of recovery. Effective meeting formats keep the primary purpose in focus and encourage members to participate in a way that expresses recovery. We lead by example, sharing experience instead of advice. Group members help further our purpose when they take personal responsibility for keeping the meeting recovery oriented. All of our actions convey a message, and Tradition 5 reminds us to make it a message of recovery. There are many distracting influences that can divert us from our primary purpose. For instance, our groups may be tempted to use meeting time to discuss their business and finances or talk about some controversy. As individual members, we can get caught up in socializing with our friends, ignoring another addict who may be in pain and needs our encouragement. But each time our focus is diverted from our primary purpose, the addict seeking recovery loses out. Other influences can distort our group's focus on its primary purpose. From the money members contribute, our groups pay rent on their meeting space, buy literature and supplies, conduct activities, and support non-services. All of these can either help further our primary purpose or 72. Distract us from our focus. Some groups seek to outdo others with luxurious meeting spaces, extravagant refreshments, huge supplies of literature, and elaborate activities. When we do this, our focus is distracted away from our primary purpose and onto money, property, and prestige. We should try to establish a reputation for carrying the message nothing more, nothing less. 
Money, literature, and reading space are tools we can use to help us carry the message. However, they should serve us, not rule us. The groups can provide many services to carry the message. Our primary service is the non-meeting, where addicts share their recovery directly with one another. Additional services like phone lines, public information work, and H&I panels also help carry the message. In rural areas and newer not communities, groups are sometimes the only source of such services. However, most groups find they cannot maintain their focus on their recovery meetings and also carry out other services. For this reason, groups usually assign responsibility for such services to their area committees. That way, groups reserve their time and energy for carrying the message directly to the addict who still suffers. Because carrying the message is so important, many groups take inventory periodically to help ensure that our primary purpose is still in focus. The 12 traditions may be used as an outline for a group inventory. Some groups use a specific set of inventory questions, such as, how well are we carrying the message of recovery? Are there a big star group isn't reaching? How can we make our meetings more accessible? What can we do to make new members feel more at home? Has the atmosphere of recovery diminished? Would a change in our meeting format strengthen that atmosphere? Considering the needs of the larger not community may lead to other changes. For instance, if there are no step meetings in one town, a group may consider having meetings that focus on the steps. There are many ways to carry the message and meet the needs of both the group and the not community. There is a power that works through this program. We tap this power when we practice the 12 step as individuals, carrying the message to other addicts. When groups carry the message, the impact of the 12th step is greatly multiplied. Even more impressive than sheer numbers of recovering addicts is the unity of purpose and the atmosphere of recovery found in meetings of spiritual power. The evidence of that power in the group is hard to deny. It is a power we can draw on between meetings to stay clean. Tradition 5 focuses the group's priority on carrying the message. Members can do many things to further our primary purpose. For example, we show our care and our willingness to help by taking turns greeting people at the door, preparing lists of telephone numbers to distribute, or offering packets of literature to newcomers. When members come together as a group to undertake the task of carrying the message, they offer an attractive picture of recovery in action. Many meetings are structured to carry the message to our newest members. These new members often need more encouragement to stay, more answers to their questions, more of our love and care. But the newest members are not the only addicts who need the message of recovery. The still suffering addict with whom we share our hope may be any one of us, regardless of clean time. Tradition 5 is not limited to helping newcomers. The message of recovery is for all of us. Applying spiritual principles. 73. The fifth tradition complements the twelfth step. It asks groups to carry the message to addicts. As individuals, we are asked in the steps to apply principles in all our affairs. This is also important in our actions as groups. Some of the principles we have applied to help us observe the fifth tradition include integrity, responsibility, unity, and anonymity. 
Integrity or fidelity to the principles embodied in the Twelve Traditions is demonstrated when groups carry the non-message of recovery. Many of our members have much to offer on a variety of subjects, but our fellowship has its own special message. Freedom from active addiction through practice of NAS 12 steps and the support of the Fellowship of Recovering Addicts. Groups demonstrate this when they offer vigorous, conscious support for addicts seeking to work the NA program. When groups conscientiously cultivate this kind of integrity, their meetings further our primary purpose. The fifth tradition gives our groups a great responsibility to maintain our fellowship's primary purpose. Each group is responsible to become as effective a vehicle for carrying the non message as it can be. Allowing our groups to lose sight of our primary purpose may deprive an addict of a chance to hear our message of hope. Each member is responsible to help the group keep our primary purpose in focus. Unity is one of our greatest strengths in carrying the message. Unity of purpose keeps our focus on carrying the message. As groups, we work together to ensure not only our own personal recovery but the recovery of every non-member. The evidence of many addicts staying clean and seeking our common good is very persuasive. We don't recover alone. In anonymity, our personal differences are insignificant compared to our primary purpose. When we come together as a group, our first task is to carry the message, all else ought to be set aside. Groups can practice the fifth tradition by reminding their members that the recovery message, not individual personalities, is primary in Narcotics Anonymous. Narcotics Anonymous is a fellowship with meetings around the world. Our primary purpose is a common thread that unites us. Tradition 5 defines the focus of Narcotics Anonymous. This focus also helps to ensure our survival as a fellowship. The fifth tradition asks us to serve other addicts by carrying the message that recovery is possible in Narcotics Anonymous. This concentrated focus protects the integrity of our fellowship. Tradition 6. 74. And now group ought never endorse, finance, or lend a non-name to any related facility or outside enterprise. Less problem with money, property, or prestige diverted from our primary purpose. While each group has the one primary purpose, there are many ways to do
understand them. He shows her startling new sensual freedom and stating his meaning of God. Lily is instructed in his father's secret inner life by a former student of his father, Ferdinand and Mahaki. Burhan and Rumi also study Sanayanatar. At his father's death Rumi took over the position of Sheikh in the Dervish learning community in Konya. His life seems to have been a fairly normal one for religious scholar teaching, meditating, helping the poor until in the late fall of 1244 when he met a stranger who put a question to him. That stranger was the wandering dervish, Jams of Tabriz, who had traveled throughout the Middle East searching and praying for someone who could endure my company. A voice came, what will you give in return? My head, the one you seek is Jalaluddin of Konya. The question Jams spoke made the learned professor came to the ground. We cannot be entirely certain of the question, but according to the most reliable account Shams asked who is greater, Muhammad or Vestami, for Vestami had said, How great is my glory, whereas Muhammad had acknowledged in his prayer to God, We do not know you as we should. Rumi heard the death out of which the question came and fell to the ground. He was finally able to answer that Muhammad was greater, because Vestami had taken one gulp of the divine and stopped there, whereas for Muhammad the way was always unfolding. There are various versions of this encounter, but whatever the facts, Shams and Rumi became inseparable. Their friendship is one of the mysteries. They spent months together without any human needs, transported into a region of pure conversation. This ecstatic connection caused difficulties in the religious community. Rumi's students felt neglected, sensing the trouble. Shams disappeared as suddenly as he had appeared. Anne-Marie Schimmel, a scholar immersed for 40 years in the works of Rumi, thinks that it was at this first disappearance that Rumi began the transformation into a mystical artist. He turned into a poet, began to listen to music, and sang, whirling around, hour after hour. Word came that Shams was in Damascus. Rumi sent his son, Sultan Belich, to Syria to bring his friend back to Konya. When Rumi and Shams met for the second time, they fell at each other's feet, so that no one knew who was lover and who the beloved. Shams stayed in Rumi's home and was married to a young girl who had been brought up in the family. Again the long mystical conversation still that began, and again the jealousy grew. On the night of December 5th, LZ48, as Rumi and Shams were talking, Shams was called to the back door. He went out, never to be seen again. Most likely, he was murdered with the connivance of Rumi's son, Alidin, if so, Shams indeed gave his head for the privilege of mystical friendship. The mystery of the friend's absence covered Rumi's world. He himself went out searching for Shams and journeyed again to Damascus. It was there that he realized, Why should I seek? I am the same as he. His essence speaks through me. I have been looking for myself. The union became complete. There was full Tana, annihilation in the friend. Shams was writing the poem. Rumi calls a huge selection of his odes and quatrains the works of Shams of Tabriz. After Shams' death and Rumi's merging with him, another companion was found, Saladin Zarkov, the goldsmith. Saladin became the friend to whom Rumi addressed his poems, not so fiery as to Shams, but with quiet tenderness. 
Lynn Saladin died. Susan Chalabi, Looney's scribe and favorite student, assumed this role. Looney claimed that Newsom was the source, the one who understood the vast, secret order of the Mathmoney, that great work that shifts so fantastically from theory to folklore to this to ecstatic poetry. For the last 12 years of his life, Looney dictated the six volumes of this master. Work to Newsom, he died on December 17, 1273. A note on the organization of this book. The design of this book is meant to confuse scholars who will divide Rumi's poetry into the accepted categories, the Quatrain Rubaiyat and those goggles of the Divan, the six books of the Matthew, the Discourses, the Letters, and the almost unknown Six Sermons. The mind wants categories, but Rumi's creativity was a continuous fountaining from beyond forms in the mind, or as the Sufis say, from a mind within the mind, the called, which is a great compassionate generosity. The 27 divisions here are faint and playful palimpsests spread over Rumi's imagination. Poems easily splash over, slide from one overlay to another. The unity behind, Layaha Alalahu, there's no reality but God, there is only God, is the one substance the other subheadings flow within at various depths. If one actually selected an essential, gloomy, it would be the zikr, the remembering that everything is God. Likewise, the titles of the poems are whimsical. Rumi's individual poems in Persian have no titles. His collection of quatrains and those is called the works of Shams of Tabriz, Savani Shamshi Tabriz. The six books of poetry he dictated to his scribe, Husam Shalabi, are simply titled spiritual couplets nationally, or sometimes he refers to them as the Book of Husam. The wonderful Zuki title of the discourses, and it what's in it Fihi Ma Fihi, may mean, what's in the Mathnui is in this too, or it may be the kind of hand thrown up gesture it sounds like. All of which makes the point that these poems are not monumental in the Western sense of memorializing moments. They are not discrete entities but are fluid, continuously self-revising, self-interrupting medium. They are not so much about anything as spoken from within. Something. Call it enlightenment, ecstatic love, spirit, soul, truth, the ocean of ILM, divine luminous wisdom, or the covenant of the last the original agreement with God. Names do not matter. Some resonance of ocean resides in everyone. Rumri's poetry can be felt as a salt breeze from that, traveling inland. These poems were created, not in packets and batches of art, but as part of a constant, practical, and mysterious discourse Rumi was having with a dervish learning community. The focus changed from stern, to ecstatic, from everyday to esoteric, as the needs of the group arose. Poetry and music and movement were parts of that communal and secretly individual work of opening hearts and exploring the mystery of union with the divine. The form of this collection means to honor the variety and simultaneity of that mystical union. Most of the facts, dates, and two toys for the intellect are stashed. In the notes, Rumi took a prose prayer at the beginning of each book of the Mathnoi. Here's the blessing he gives for four books four.